What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD. What I want you guys to do before we get started in this video, I want you guys to take a second, go down the description box below. We got links to our website where there'll be a lot of awesome notes and illustrations that I think will be super critical for you guys to follow along with me during this lecture. Also, if you guys benefit from this lecture, please support us by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and please subscribe. All right, let's start talking about gastroesophageal reflux disease. So GERD is this basic concept. It's super, super basic in which things like nasty stuff like hydrochloric acid contents from the stomach, unfortunately, will just decide to move its way upwards into the esophagus. Now, when that happens, what's the downside of that? What's the actual problematic issue with this actual hydrochloric acid getting into the esophagus? Well, if we zoom in here, what you'll notice is that this acid substance within the actual esophagus can cause a lot of problems. One of these things is it can lead to just common sensations such as heartburn. And this may manifest, if you will, with this burning retrosternal chest pain that usually occurs after meals and it's really bad when you lay supine. Sometimes, because the esophagus is not just here within the chest, but it can actually come down here just to the epigastric level, you may even have epigastric pain. We call this dyspepsia. It's that burning pain that you may have right here in the epigastrium. So two very common manifestations is going to be heartburn and dyspepsia. This is super critical, and the reason why is because this hydrochloric acid is gonna be coming up into the esophagus, causing a lot of burning and inflammation. Now the question I have for you guys is, what are some of the complications that are associated with gastroesophageal reflux disease? So the basic concept is hydrochloric acid is coming up into the esophagus, it's ripping it up, causing heartburn, dyspepsia, but it can also do a lot of other things, like what? It can really inflame the esophagus and start ulcerating it, and this can lead to esophagitis. Additionally, with the esophagitis, sometimes patients can come in presenting with like things like odynophagia, like a lot of pain with swallowing, that's one common thing. The other problem here is that as you kind of cause this constant inflammation over time, if this esophagus is being inflamed and inflamed and inflamed, it'll then undergo a fibrotic reaction to heal, but it'll narrow the actual lumen of the esophagus, and this can lead to stricture formation. Another potential complication associated with this gastroesophageal reflux disease is that sometimes, this is very, very interesting, with this hydrochloric acid, not only can it inflame the esophagus lead to strictures, but sometimes the actual contents can move its way into the airway. And this could lead to features of a lot of what's called kind of a reflux or an aspiration type of event. So you wanna watch out for aspiration. Now, the problems with this, very quickly, is if you aspirate some of this hydrochloric contents into the larynx, it can cause laryngitis. What's a common manifestation of that? Voice changes. If it goes into the bronchioles, it can inflame the bronchioles and lead to inflammation of the bronchioles. What could that worsen? Asthma. So the other ways that I want you to think about GERD presenting is not just with esophagitis or strictures, but aspiration that can lead to hoarseness, larynx, and worsening asthma, bronchial inflammation. Boom, roasted. What's another potential complication? You know, if you erode and ulcerate the esophagus, there's blood vessels that are lining that. You can erode into the actual blood vessel and lead to bleeding. So you wanna watch out for GI bleeding. Ways that GI bleeds can present is this can have a patient who presents with like a lot of maybe anemia, right? So maybe it's an actual uh, a lab finding or they can present with a lot of fatigue. That's another particular thing. The last and scariest complication of gastroesophageal reflux disease over chronic and chronic and chronic inflammation is you increase the risk of what's called esophageal cancer. With that being said, one of the very interesting concepts here that we have to dig into just quickly for the pathophysiology is whenever you look at normal cells of the esophagus, it's actually stratified squamous. So it's stratified squamous. So here we'll actually write on the side here, this should be squamous cells. But whenever you expose the actual squamous cells over a long period of time to a lot of hydrochloric acid, this will cause the cells to have to adapt. When the cells have to adapt, they undergo something called metaplasia. So whenever they adapt, they change into a different type of cell. And this is gonna be called columnar cells. This process where they go from squamous to columnar, you know what that's called? 
This is called metaplasia. Let's actually write that here. This process here is called metaplasia. All right, beautiful. So going from the squamous cells to the columnar cells is called metaplasia. But then if you continue and continue to cause more erosive damage, more inflammation, you can turn these columnar cells into neoplastic cells. So you can turn these into neoplastic cells. Let's stick with our color here, which we did was blue. So again, this is our neoplastic cells. So this here, going from columnar cells to neoplastic cells, is called dysplasia. So one of the biggest things to understand here is with this metaplasia aspect, that's really a very specific type of intermediate. So I want you guys to understand kind of the progression here, is that the progression of this disease is you have something called Barrett's, and then over time, this Barrett's will then progress to what's called adenocarcinoma. So this is the metaplasia, this is the dysplasia. So this is the concept that I want you guys to understand. Okay, now let's go and let's talk about the different causes of GERD. All right, my friends, so gastroesophageal reflux disease, heartburn, dyspepsia from the reflux of the hydrochloric acid. We know the complications associated with it. Esophagitis, strictures, aspiration. We also know that you can have GI bleeds and we know that you can have esophageal cancer. The question that you have to ask yourself is why is the hydrochloric acid going up into the esophagus as much it is, as it is causing these complications? There's four particular reasons. One of the reasons is that this part here, this is a problematic area for us. This area here is called the lower esophageal sphincter. It's supposed to be nice and tight and prevent things like hydrochloric acid from going up into the esophagus. But what if the tone is really low? That's one particular mechanism. So a low, lower esophageal sphincter tone. Another particular mechanism that can cause this is that there is a defect somewhere here. So you know the esophagus is supposed to go up through this little area here called the esophageal hiatus. But in certain patients, they have a defect within that junction and it slides upwards. And if it slides upwards above the actual esophageal hiatus, this is a very significant problem for GERD. You know what that's called? Where parts of the esophagus slides up above the esophageal hiatus? This is called a hiatal hernia. Remember that, hiatal hernia. Okay, the third particular problem here is that the hydrochloric acid that you're producing by the stomach is much more. So if you have hydrochloric acid going up into the esophagus, it's gonna burn it. But what if you had a lot more hydrochloric acid? You're likely gonna cause more symptoms. The more hydrochloric acid, the more severe the actual GERD can be. So another particular problem here is that we have cells of the stomach that is just banging out hydrochloric acid. So that's another particular mechanism is increased hydrochloric acid production. All right, let me take you through a quick mechanism here of why this is a problem and how we can actually treat this. So here we have a couple parietal cells. You know parietal cells are cells that make hydrochloric acid? There's a couple ways that they do this. One way that they do this is they use these kind of like proton potassium ATPases to push out things like potassium and pro, I'm sorry, push out things like protons. And these protons are what make the hydrochloric acid content super, super acidic. So there's one thing, that's the proton pumps, but you also have little receptors here on these cells that tell them to actually stimulate and increase the production of hydrochloric acid. You know what these are? These are histamine II receptors. So what are these particular receptors here? These guys here are called histamine II receptors. When these receptors are stimulated, they increase, they increase the hydrochloric acid production. And this is super important because you know when we talk about pharmacology, if we give drugs that block this proton pump, like proton pump inhibitors, you would decrease the hydrochloric acid production. If we give drugs that block the histamine from binding to the H2 receptors, you would block hydrochloric acid production. That'll come into play when we talk about the actual pharmacology. Okay, the last particular mechanism here is that you have a very high intragastric pressure. Imagine the pressure in your stomach is higher than the pressure within your esophagus. Where are things gonna to wanna to go? From high pressure to low pressure. Things will decompress into the esophagus. So that's the last particular problem here is you're gonna have a patient who has very high intragastric pressure. All right, so out of all of this, these are the four reasons why the patient would develop a very nasty gastroesophageal reflux disease. What I wanna do is I wanna quickly talk about
What are the things that decrease the lower esophageal sphincter tone? What are the actual basic type of hiatal hernia that is really, really highly associated with GERD? What increases hydrochloric acid production? And what increases intragastric pressure? So let's come down here and let's go through these and let's write them all down because again, I think this will help you with the repetition. First one, decrease the lower esophageal sphincter tone. Next one is you have a hiatal hernia. Third one is you have high intragastric pressure. And the fourth mechanism is you have increased hydrochloric acid production. Okay, we have to now say what is the reasons why you have a low esophageal sphincter tone. One of these is because the patient is smoking, drinking alcohol, or they're just consuming tons and tons of caffeine. These are very, very common triggers. So I want you to remember these particular causes. All right, so again, smoking, alcohol, caffeine are triggers that lower the esophageal sphincter tone. All right, <clears throat> hiatal hernias, what is the most common type associated with GERD? I want you to remember sliding hernias, sliding hernias. The next thing I want you to remember is what are the things that can increase the intragastric pressure causing it to decompress the contents into the esophagus? Pregnancy, obesity, as well as very large meals and one other disease called gastroparesis. So again, pregnancy, obesity, very large meals, gastroparesis, which is a disease associated with diabetes. It's where the nerves of the actual stomach aren't actually working properly, so the stomach can't contract. If you can't contract, can you empty things into the actual duodenum? No. So all the stomach does is distend, 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 pressure rises, can decompress into the actual esophagus. The last one here is you increase hydrochloric acid production. The big things are things like NSAIDs, alcohol, smoking, and a rare, rare disease called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Okay, again, NSAIDs, alcohol, smoking, Zellinger-Ellison syndrome, which is a rare disorder where you actually have a tumor, like a pancreatic tumor, that pumps out gastrin. You know what gastrin does to hydrochloric acid production? Cranks it up. All right, so these are the mechanisms behind gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, let's dig into the diagnostic approach. All right, so GERD, heartburn, we know the particular three pathophysiological processes. Intragastric pressure, GE ab uh, gastroesophageal junction abnormality, or reduced lower esophageal sphincter tone. We know the three complications that they can present with. How do we diagnose this? Well, GERD's generally a clinical diagnosis, but I think it's important to remember that oftentimes they'll present with heartburn. And so heartburn kind of presents, sometimes presents like chest pain. And here's the other thing. Sometimes patients who present with heartburn or maybe even a little bit of like epigastric abdominal pain, dyspepsia, we don't want to miss an inferior mind. And so you should always, in any complaint of chest pain, obtain an ECG, and depending upon the ECG results, get troponins. If you see any evidence of ST elevation, reciprocal changes, and positive troponins, this is not GERD. This is potentially an acute coronary syndrome, and you should completely change your diagnostic approach here. But if it comes back normal and there is no evidence of any true changes, such as troponin elevation, no ST depression, T wave inversions or elevations, then I'm starting to think it could be more GERD related. So how do I do this? It's more of just you try a treatment and see if it improves it. What I do is I would initiate an empiric PPI trial. I'll give them a proton pump inhibitor. That'll suppress the hydrochloric acid production in the stomach. And if that happens, I'll reduce the hydrochloric acid moving into the esophagus and causing the heartburn sensation and complications. Do they get better? If they do, it's probably GERD. If they don't, then you can't completely exclude that it's not GERD. So then what else could we do? If maybe their symptoms are not significantly better with the PPI, then I really want to start asking myself the question, is there any severe complications? Am I missing something? So I look for alarm symptoms. Is there dysphagia? Because that could identify a stricture. Is there vomiting? That could identify a stricture. Is there anemia? This could be indicative of a GI bleed or sometimes even cancer. And is there weight loss? This could be indicative of a stricture or cancer. If I have any of these alarm symptoms, I have to get an EGD with a biopsy. The reason why is GERD can lead to potential complications. And I wanna see, is this just esophagitis from the reflux? 
Or does this look really bad? And I got some really bad like reflux like related strictures here. And then worst case scenario is, is there cancer? And so sometimes this may lead you to kind of find potential complications related to the GERD. I think one of the big things though is if a patient has a normal EGD, they have not improved with the empiric PPI trial, then I think the next thing that you could potentially do is say, let me just rule out any other type of esophageal disorder. So I'm gonna get esophageal manometry. And if I do that, I can rule out an esophageal motility disorder. Because if all they have is their lower esophageal sphincter tone is reduced, but all the other mid-distal kind of tone is normal, it's likely GERD. And if that's the case, I've ruled out any other esophageal motility disorder. The other thing that I can do is I can get pH monitoring. This is where I take kind of a little, uh, it's kind of like a pH sensor, goes through the nose, down into the esophagus, and it has different pH centers at each different point here of the esophagus. What happens is in a patient who has very bad GERD, hydrochloric acid will move up into the esophagus and it'll trigger this pH sensor. So the amount of times that this pH sensor picks up that the pH is lower than it's supposed to be, it'll trigger a triggering of the score activation. And what happens is this will lead to the, act, the calculation of something called a Demeester score. And the Demeester score greater than 14.7, how they came up with that, I'm not sure, really helps me to identify that this sensor was picking up drops in pH pretty frequently, and it really adds to the diagnosis of GERD. So that's how I would go about it. Empiric PPI trial, they improve, it's GERD. If they have alarm symptoms, get an EGWD with biopsy. If that's normal, but they're still not better with the PPI trial, rule out that it's not an esophageal motility disorder, and then from there, try and do a, a actual pH monitoring to definitely see if they have the evidence of GERD. Now, we've identified GERD. How do we treat it? It's really pretty straightforward. We gotta suppress hydrochloric acid production because that's the crux of it all. Obviously, it's about treating the underlying causes. So in obesity, what should you do? Lose weight. In patients who have some type of uh, maybe trigger such as caffeine, reduce your caffeine. If you're smoking, stop smoking. If you drink alcohol, reduce your alcohol intake. These are things that potentially can be reversed. But otherwise, it should always start with trying to suppress the hydrochloric acid production. In patients with severe GERD, so really bad heartburn, maybe on top of that they have atypical findings like cough, laryngitis, worsening of their asthma, and maybe they even have a GERD complication. Maybe they have reflux esophagitis. Maybe they have strictures. Maybe on top of that they've had GI bleeds, or maybe they have some type of Barrett's esophagus. You need to get them on a PPI right away and keep that going for at least eight weeks and then reevaluate if I can actually step down on that PPI. PPIs work by kind of suppressing hydrochloric acid production, right? So they block these hydrogen proton ATPase channels, reduce hydrochloric acid secretion, that reduces a lot of the GERD and complications associated with GERD. Now, if the patient has mild GERD, they just have some mild heartburn, they have no evidence of any complications, no esophagitis, no strictures, no Barrett's, nothing to that effect, I think H2RAs are a little bit more appropriate. The reason why is PPIs, they can interfere with other drugs and reduce the actual bioavailability of those drugs because they can interact with the cytochrome P450 complex. And on top of that, it actually has been associated with like electrolyte abnormalities such as hypomagnesemia and C. diff. So it's important to remember that. And so sometimes H2RAs are just a little bit more safe and not as having as many complications. So this would be things like famotidine, that's a very common one, ranitidine, whereas PPIs are things like omeprazole, pantoprazole, lansoprazole. So how does an H2RA work? It's the same concept. It's gonna suppress the actual histamine response at the receptor site. Histamine actually helps to stimulate hydrochloric acid production. So if I give them this, it'll block the actual histamine at that receptor, reduce the hydrochloric acid secretion, and reduce GERD and the any for formation of any complications of that sense. Oftentimes when patients come in, if they have severe GERD and GERD complications, put them on a PPI for eight weeks, review to see if they're getting any better, and see if you can step down to an H2RA. If they can't, then maybe you have to go back to the lowest dose of the PPI that they were on where they were completely controlled. If they're on an H2RA and they develop any worsening GERD or GERD complications, then you have to up titrate them to a PPI. Let's say that you've had them on max PPI and they're still not getting any better. They're still having very bad GERD. They're having GERD-related complications. Then you need to go to what's called a Nissen's fundoplication. 
So what that is, is you're going to basically take a part of the fundus and you're going to, you're basically going to help to reinforce the lower esophageal sphincter. So you're going to take the fundus and literally wrap this sucker around the lower esophageal sphincter and tighten that area up. And so look at this thing. I took the fundus, wrapped it around it, and then I sutured it tight. And now I have a very, very tight lower esophageal sphincter, which will reduce into the hydrochloric acid leaking back up into the esophagus, reducing the GERD-related complications. So that'd be a Nissen's fund application if they have refractory GERD that's not responsive to medical therapy, and then also improvement or at least treating of their underlying cause. Last thing is GERD has a very high risk of cancer, especially if it's chronic. So you need to survey these patients. If they have any alarm symptoms, such as vomiting, they have dysphagia, they have anemia, they have weight loss, you really should be doing an EGD. If they have no dysplasia on an EGD, then you should at least check it every three to five years. But if they do have any evidence of dysplasia, you want to catch it right then and there and ablate that area of cancer or resect that area of cancer. And that's something that we'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about esophageal cancer in the actual oncology section. All right, my friends, that covers GERD. I hope that made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.